Good evening from our headquarters in Kiev. This is the Sunday show, the only TV program, TV discussion explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm in English in the prime time. And I'm Natalia Humanyuk, and that's what we prepared for you tonight. <laughs> Illegal elections in separatist-controlled territories, how they could affect Russian-Ukrainian conflict. How Ukrainian authorities react to the death of a Kherson-based activist and city council advisor Katerina Handzuk. And the resignation of the Ukrainian prosecutor general, which didn't happen. 70 world leaders, including Trump, Putin and Poroshenko, commemorate 100 years of World War I. Live from Paris. So we have with us um, Alexei Matsuka, who is the uh, editor of the Donbass News and the journalist who had to come from Donetsk already almost five years ago uh, to discuss the elections in the um, to discuss the elections in so-called DPR and LPR. Uh, they are illegal. There were a lot of concerns by international organizations and the Ukrainian authorities not to come to these elections. So that's what we will have. So good evening. Hello. And um, I think for the first, we have to explain to our audience what's uh, going on, uh, what's going on with these elections. Uh, and first of all, there are two leaders uh, of, I think that those who are currently running those republics, uh, Denis Pushilin, as well the uh, Leonid Pasichnik, uh, and there was a change, so uh, they are they are favorites of Russia. Uh, we can hear, we, we can see them, Leonid Pasichnik from L. Uh, Luhansk, who had come after uh, Igor Plotnitsky had to leave the territory, and also Denis Pushilin, who is running the so-called separatist republic after the assassination of Zaharchenko. Uh, and we know that they're Kremlin um, favorites, or we know that the other candidates, they are existing, uh, they largely unknown to the audience, uh, unknown to the people in these republics. But what should we know about these elections, apart from the part that they are illegal, and somehow nobody accept them and Ukraine condemn them and everybody, international community, called to Russia that they shouldn't happen. You know that uh, first my message about that yesterday a lot of journalists who cover situation in occupied area, they got um, uh, very aggressive messages on Facebook and by mail about how they should explain what happened in occupied area and also uh, self-proclaimed authorities demanded from them, uh, you know, that uh, journalists, how, uh, what the way how journalists should explain this. For example, they ban and they stop all video with empty uh, places for vote, for example, and, and if you want to film it or picture it, uh, you faced with uh, troubles after that. And I just suggest our team also would have the video of what's going on today, so that would be the uh, support for, for what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, but I got from, yeah. uh, from our readers and viewers from Occupied Terra a lot of messages today that uh, central poll stations in central district of Donetsk city were absolutely empty during this day. And also other uh, data that we compare, for example, uh, during uh, situation before war, how many uh, stations were opened before war? For example, it was uh, more than uh, two two thousand five hundred stations before war worked in all uh, in just in Donetsk city in Donetsk regions, but now self-proclaimed authorities they said that they opened just four hundred uh, so places. There were you how know many? that now now four hundred and there were. In the in occupied area, yeah. in in Donetsk, Makivka, other cities, in all area. But before war, it was two two thousand five hundred. You know that they want to. Uh, what what I uh, think yeah. about it? Because why they did this? Because they want to show, show that people, that are people to want the to come and vote. Yes, and and express the show the picture that people want to um, show their opinions and they support the idea of uh, independent this uh, territory. But this mistake, and we had uh, uh, data from sociological research, uh, I wrote about th that article on Hramatsky International website, and we saw that during two years, if compare 2016 and 19, 
uh, 18 uh, uh, that how many people who support reintegration to Ukraine, uh, majority, uh, not majority, but big number of people who support idea after uh, change status of that territory, they demanded, they think that if Donbass uh, has a special status, so they agree to reintegrate to Ukraine. But I think like that's something, let's nail it down, that's something very critical you said. We, we see this video and of course uh, today I think maybe our audience uh, doesn't know that you know there are an immense amount of these separatist telegram channels, video which are really showing that people are coming, that they are voting. Uh, but yes, if you said that there are like less than two thousands Polls where people are, are yeah, coming. And also, you can see that it is absolutely different picture than we saw uh, four years ago during the so-called referendum. I don't see the uh, cues, for example, now on these pictures that they express it uh, four years but, ago. But still, what is interesting, still, you know, it's separatist uh, control republic. We, we've just seen uh, Denis Pushilin. And his wife. Uh, and his wife voting. And this is uh, the first appearance. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. So the point is that, yeah, here is voting the future and current head of so-called Donetsk People Republic, very close ally of Vladislav Surkov, who is working for the Russian government. Um, uh, can you remind us what we understood that there were some kind of, I won't say real candidates, but the candidates like Khodakovsky, like uh, Gubarev, kind mm -hmm. of the names in the separ among the separatists, but they didn't run, they were not allowed to run properly, and there were still three names who nobody knew. Yeah, this is the uh, surnames who has approved, who approved by uh, Central uh, Election Commission. Uh, this is absolutely technical persons who has a special improvement for uh, participation. But, but what uh, we need to know and our audience that even pro-Russian candidates who want to join on this election, they were banned from the self-proclaimed authorities. Because Khodakovsky, he had, he has more, he had a lot of um, fans or voters for him, and I think that Pushlin afraid him. Also, other uh, uh, other people who was it is uh, Hakim Zyanov. He was he is a member of Communist Party so-called Communist Party, but uh, 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 one month ago, during the uh, political party um, meeting, uh, it was a bomb uh, during this meeting, and uh, he refused. He, I think, he afraid. And Pushilin uh, sit around technical, technical candidates during these so-called elections, and and he has a one high level of rating during these uh, votes. I just should say that probably more or less the same is in Luhansk region, where really it's not that you kind of try to make it, but you really know that those people, locals, don't know them, those who are in the ballots, and it's very clearly that those people who come to power either after assassination of Zaharchenko or after the uh, fact when uh, Igor Plotnitsky, who was from the very, almost from the very beginning of the conflict and uh, is currently in, in, in Russia, that, um, that, that, that they would run the, the republics. I should also probably mention, and I think like when, while we're explaining to the audience, that yes, people you mentioned like Hadakovsky, they are warlords, war commanders, who have at least some legitimacy beyond the separatists themselves. But he left uh, occupied he area left occupied and territory. now he lives in, in Russia Federation and Russia uh, stopped him on the border when he wanted to join on this election. So you really have the very clearly controlled people like Pushilin and like Pasichnik. But uh, Alexei, what, we, what it means that they still have those elections? Why they need that? Because there was a call from the international community to Russia not really even to them, that these elections shouldn't happen because there is a Minsk process. Yeah, I saw uh, today an uh, interview of Chesnakov to, uh, Chesnakov, to, uh, to, we should to explain. TV yes, he deputy of Surkov. That, yeah. Yes, he's, uh, yes he, uh, he explained that Moscow needs this because they want to show, to, to show that um, Pushilin and Pasichnik will be as uh, official representatives of their territories in Minsk meetings. 
and they can build bridges with Ukraine because Russia uh, now, as uh, four years before, they see that Kyiv should speak directly with uh, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk without Moscow. So they want to, to create this picture that people in occupied area choose that people they, as a, their representatives. But it's very important to understand that uh, IDP persons who uh, left that territory and also refugees who live in Russia now, it is more than one million, I think even more, two millions, they of course can't to, to be a part of this process to, to elect uh, on this election. So I don't know, uh, is uh, Pushilin really uh, my official representatives? Of course no, and my neighbors and my relatives who you live mean, on like those territory. people who yeah, live in Yeah, yeah of yeah. course. And, and uh, this is and it is also one uh, point that can get um, uh, to us information that this is process absolutely illegal. So uh, just besides it's illegal, I still would like to rem remind mainly, I remember four years ago, there were these elections in 2014. There were you still foreign referendum? reporters. No, 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 no. In the autumn, in there the were autumn, later, yeah. after already occupation, there were like so-called elections as well. There were foreign reporters, there were still people, there were like def definitely longer queues, which we don't really see uh, today. today. Uh, still, maybe you would just to finalize this discussion, what do we expect tomorrow? <laughs> You know, I think that we will see the officials, so-called, who name, who said that uh, people name them our representatives. It is absolutely uh, continue logical um, way that we saw during these four years before. And Pushilin and Pasichnik say, yes, now we, as a, uh, your officials in Minsk agreement. So it is, it is like Russia recognized them as an independent country. <laughs> okay, Alexei, thanks a lot. You Thank know, you. these are the, the elections, so-called elections, but I think for our audience, it's exactly the moment when we can really discuss and understand what's going on there on the political level, which I also would probably remind that uh, this fact that the Harchenko had been killed and uh, the, the fact that uh, Pasichnik has to run um, Luhansk and region. And Plotnitsky removed. And Plotnitsky is removed also shows still the process that the, all the leaders are already gone, those who fought are already gone, and there are those people currently and uh, there were also somehow inner fights which were there, they were really um, fought in a way and, and those guys had won. Okay. Thank you. While, um, while we uh, just finished this part of the program, um, I should also say that uh, we're following what's happening in Paris as it's 100 years anniversary of the end of the First World War, which is extremely important for Ukraine. Ukrainians fought on a uh, different side of that conflict. There are millions of people who had passed away. And 70 leaders are in Paris today, including the Ukrainian president, but also Russian uh, President Putin and American President Donald Trump. And we have uh, with us, we just earlier had chance to spoke to Bogdan Tupin, who is U European correspondent of the Voice of America and is currently in Paris looking if this event, though it's symbolic, may uh, you know, lead, to, uh, lead to something and Ukraine or other issues are discussed there. So, Bohdan, you're currently in Paris. There are more than 70 uh, world leaders. Uh, of course, the most important are the presidents of uh, France and the Chancellor of Germany. Uh, but we know as well that there is the uh, president of the U.S. in Paris, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, the Ukrainian president. Uh, so really, what the most important in this event? And besides its symbolism, what else would be discussed during this uh, peace forum, which is also a part of the commemoration. I think I would say that when we are talking about uh, events today, and not only today uh, in Paris uh, and in France altogether, then it's not about uh, political political talks. We're not expecting any agreements uh, or political agreements. But what we are seeing is that uh, leaders of the countries, and many of them were involved in the World War One. Uh, 
are now gathering here and they are trying to understand what happened 100 years ago and what they can do in order not to repeat those mistakes and to avoid uh, wars, uh, especially uh, in Europe. And in this, uh, in this sense, of course, everybody is following uh, President Trump. Whatever uh, U.S. leader says uh, makes uh, big waves and uh, whatever he does or doesn't do, like, for example, yesterday, him cancelling his trip to, to visit American Cemetery here, uh, not far away from Paris, uh, the fact that he didn't go there uh, obviously attracted lots of attention, especially in American media. But uh, we are talking about uh, symbolic gatherings. We are talking about solemn music in the center of Paris. Uh, we are talking about processions and, and people dressed in uh, uniforms of, of those times. And of course, uh, here, this, this forum, uh, people really are trying to make something out of this uh, 100 years of anniversary. Because, of course, uh, we can talk about numbers, uh, millions of people dead. But the question is, can we do something to avoid the repetition? Can we do something to avoid the mistake of uh, World War II following almost very quickly after World War I? And here, uh, after uh, going through the documents uh, of the forum, I saw that they are talking about 800 concrete proposals about uh, what to do in order to uh, promote peace and, and probably uh, avoid current uh, instability in Europe. Uh, it would be great if uh, those uh, hundreds of proposals actually helped, Natalia. And, but um, there were before the talks that that would be, might be the first meeting between Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump. Later was said that the meeting, the formal meeting won't happen, but there is always an opportunity to have it, you know, by, by, by chance or, or that. As well, we know the Ukrainian president there, and in particular France and Germany are playing the role in the Normandy Forum in uh, trying to solve the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. So, if not in the official uh, program, you know, what's going on with that? And uh, if in any way Ukraine or the solution of particularly today's conflicts are mentioned, or the organizers plan by purpose really to avoid that? Because still, it's not, you, it, it's not that often that all these people gather at one place. Yeah, and of course, when those kind of leaders are together and we have a number of events, uh, we had a commemoration uh, on the streets of Paris, uh, there will be uh, lunches, dinners, informal gatherings, and it depends what do you mean by uh, talks or a meeting. It is quite possible that any leader, including uh, Mr. Trump or Mr. Putin, they can meet, they, they can have a word with each other. But what we, are, what we were told is that there will be no formal a meeting. There will be uh, no formal talks between uh, two, two leaders. And of course, uh, we had lots of uh, information before that. Last month, we had reports from, from Kremlin that uh, such a meeting is going to happen. And, and uh, even American representatives, uh, for example, uh, American uh, aide uh, for, for, for uh, President Donald Trump was uh, talking about this kind of possibility. But then it was dismissed. It was dismissed personally by President Trump, who said that uh, he's going to be so busy that he will not have any time to meet and to talk to, to President Putin. It doesn't mean, of course, that they would not be able to, I don't know, maybe shake hands or, or, or say a couple of words. Uh, if we're talking about uh, current conflict uh, in Ukraine, uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, uh, at this point of the day, uh, I did not hear any mentioning of it, official mentioning. Uh, we are talking about symbolic proposals, speeches, uh, about bigger problems in the world, about tensions. But I understand that it is probably not the day and not the time. Uh, and uh, world leaders who are gathering here today in Paris, they are probably not going to pretend that they are able to do something about Ukrainian or Russian-Ukrainian war at this point. So uh, we are not going to hear about it probably here in Paris too much. Bogdan, thanks a lot. That was the uh, European correspondent of Voice of America who is covering 100 years, um, uh, the commemoration of the 100 years of the World War I, uh, the war which is extremely important for Ukraine and Eastern Europe where a lot of people participated and passed. <laughs>
It's already one week since we knew uh, that uh, Katerina Handzuk, a Ukrainian activist from Kherson and political advisor, had passed away after she had been uh, attacked in July. So he'd been, she's been killed for her uh, activities. That was a huge shock for the Ukrainian society. Uh, and uh, we have with us uh, Yvan Krapivin, a lawyer and expert from Reanimation a Package of Reform, to discuss the reaction of the Ukrainian authorities as well, the demands of the Ukrainian civil society to investigate this case, but also what's happened to the general prosecutor who in the beginning announced that he would resign, but in the end the president didn't accept this resignation. So this topic kind of overwhelmed everything which had happened uh, with uh, Katya Hanzuk. Um, so good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me. I just should also say that probably we would show that our team also traveled uh, to to Kherson mm -hmm. to show the funerals of Katya. That was a huge shock for everybody. But how would you assess the reaction of the authorities and what could have been done this week? Yeah, good question, because uh, we know that uh, it was a several attacks uh, for civil society activists or even uh, politicians. Uh, and uh, usually uh, it was not uh, investigated at all. And uh, the case of Katerina Khantyuk uh, became uh, some kind of uh, catalyst. It starts this discussion and demands uh, of resignation of top uh, law enforcement heads like Minister of Internal Affairs Avakov or General Prosecutor Yuri Lutsenko or the head of State's Bureau of uh, State's Security Service. So uh, for these five years after the Revolution of Dignity, as I know, it's more than 100 cases when uh, civil society activists were attacked by uh, some uh, so some person. It's, uh, for example, Vitaly Ustinka from Odessa or Sergei Stenenko or Oleg Koval who was uh, shooted by a gun and so on. And now we have, uh, we have a death of uh, a, a famous uh, case of Katerina Handzuk. And uh, as I said, uh, civil society demands of, uh, to resignation and, of course, uh, because they do not trust to the top officials and do not trust that they can efficiently uh, investigate these crimes. And, yeah. So there was a demand, uh, first of all, to create this special investigation commission in the Parliament. Uh, we've just earlier seen the pictures of the MPs standing and demanding that in, in the Rada. Uh, why you think that that would be efficient? And also there is a, an issue with that because there was another controversy that uh, some of the MPs were not included, like Mustafa Nayem. At mm -hmm. the same time, uh, another MP who is very close to the uh, Minister Avakov, Anton Gerashenko, and whom the family of Katya Ganzuk and Katya him, herself when she was still alive, kind of demanded uh, not to be, uh, not demanded, but kind of named as somebody who uh, revealed the secrets of the investigation and condemned uh, that these people are included. So why you think as the lawyer that this would work and what we, uh, maybe our audience, the people who are watching would like to follow, what particularly they need to look at mm -hmm. specifically? Yeah, yeah, first of all, we should say that uh, it's two parallel uh, process is the investigation of these crimes and the work of this uh, uh, special investigative commission. Because, of course, it's a task of national police, of prosecutor's office, of state security service to investigate, to find uh, the person, to prove they're guilty, and so on. And uh, special commission, it's more about parliamentarian control. Because, uh, first of all, it consisted of a uh, member of parliaments. Uh, the second is a temporary commission just for three months and uh, the third one they will prepare some report but this report is not necessary for the investigative bodies. They could uh, use it like uh, recommendations, like some information. Uh, but not uh, as a proof in criminal proceedings. So the work of this uh, commission, it's more about, again, parliamentarian control and uh, 
uh, some public reports uh, to society uh, what happening and uh, now uh, we mm, more uh, we, we have more uh, problems with some pol pol political um, element of this commission because uh, by constitution they have all author all authority to uh, investigate uh, to uh, find some materials to research them and so on but uh, general prosecutor Yuri Lutsenko from tribunal of uh, parliament uh, 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 said that uh, uh, law enforcement bodies like national police or prosecutor's office uh, will not uh, make any access uh, to this information. So they prohibited to uh, the access to materials of criminal proceedings for this commission. And now it's. Uh, uh, became some uh, political battle uh, and not uh, the real work on uh, uh, research uh, what really happened in the case of uh, Katerina Hansuk. There was a very interesting move uh, by the general prosecutor because probably there are two particular Ukrainian politicians who are, let's say, uh, uh, there was a demand of the civil society members for, to resign. It's Yuri Lutsenko and as well Minister of Interior Arsena Bakov. Uh, but in particular Yuri Lutsenko in the parliament had said that he he said he is ready to resign and that's fully distracted attention of everybody from the funerals from anything which had happened uh, but we can also hear what he said just so there are no doubts so that nobody thinks anyone's clinging to power i will submit my resignation statement to the president of ukraine and you in the parliament will have to look into this issue i'm asking you to do it this week i'm asking the head of parliament to put this issue up for voting and we will see that the coalition will not vote for it as head of the law enforcement system i will submit my resignation statement today it is now up to you to decide whether you want Mustafa Nayem to lead investigations and establish the guilty from a TV screen or law enforcement agencies that are legally responsible for it. So there were amount of people clapping that like, well done, this is a not like a pretty honored move uh, and later the president didn't accept that and on the uh, at, from the tv screen uh, the prosecutor later said that okay if president didn't accept it that's it and we know that they are political allies so what should we say about this move uh, well, generally, I think that it's some kind of political strategy because we know that uh, elections are not far from uh, the day and Yuri Lutsenko uh, was a politician and he will be a politician. So for his uh, political rating, it's a good thing uh, to answer some demands of civil society because uh, uh, he, uh, first of all, uh, said that uh, while everyone uh, make PR on uh, the blood on uh, on the, to make PR on the blood, and in the same time he is a gentleman. He uh, make his list of resignation, and uh, he will not be a, a general prosecutor. But uh, we all understand that uh, either he stay a prosecutor or he will be resigned. Uh, in any case, it uh, will be benefit for him. So again, in my uh, view, it, it, it is political strategy, even if uh, a president and Rada voted and finally he was resigned. But uh, as lawyer, I should say that this um, procedure of resignment is not so simple. Uh, of course, general uh, prosecutor is a high position. He is really a head of law enforcement. And uh, constitution, according to the constitution, it exists some guarantees uh, uh, to not uh, uh, to stay on this uh, position. So. 
Can you explain? Uh, yeah. So, so uh, it it could be the uh, approval from Verkhovna Rada, first of all. It could be it should be an approval from president, and it should be uh, some report from qualification and disciplinary commission of prosecutors about his professional work. It's necessary thing for all ways to uh, to fire general prosecutor also if he wished to resign. So it's not uh, it, it couldn't. Uh, this procedure couldn't start in one day. It should be some time to prepare this report. And in our case with Lutsenko, uh, we should understand that uh, first uh, he should uh, uh, take his list of resignation to president and just then Verkhovna Rada will vote. And we have uh, the vice versa uh, procedure. So uh, legally, this uh, vote uh, means anything. But uh, again, President uh, underlined that uh, Lutsenko had this votum of um, trust. Yeah, votum of trust. But uh, in, in political way, yes. But in legal way, it's uh, this, this vote uh, was nothing. And uh, what is more, uh, uh, no one sees this uh, list of resignation because uh, under the constitution, uh, this uh, order in which a general prosecutor can resign is uh, prescribed not just by constitution, but also by uh, the law and prosecutor. Uh, we have a new law um, for five years, and uh, it, uh, this law divides different positions. We have uh, prosecutors as administrative position, administrative workers, and prosecutors as just a prosecutors in criminal proceedings and so on. And gen uh, general prosecution, uh, prosecutor, by his position, uh, have both these uh, positions as administrative and as just a prosecutor. So uh, if this list of resign was just about uh, resigning from administrative position after the resignment, successful resignment, he will stay just a prosecutor. And it's really a ridiculous thing because uh, uh, every prosecutor has uh, higher legal education. And this general prosecutor is not, and it's some collision because uh, uh, we all know this situation. Uh, he was uh, appoint, appointed to this position by special amendments to law and prosecutors. Uh, prosecution. We call these uh, amendments uh, about the necessary people because he, as a politician, was necessary at that moment. And uh, all these uh, political games in parliament uh, is now. Uh, underlines the weak uh, legal procedure. So again, in any case, uh, in any moment, uh, a president or RADA or QDCP uh, could refuse him. And uh, we saw that president refused to take already. his... Already. And yeah, we should already. remind that uh, uh, Lutsenko is uh, from the president faction. He is yeah. one of his closest ally. His wife, who is an MP, is... Uh, one of the top leaders of the President Poroshenko party, and it's just, let's say, four and a half, five months till the elections, like yeah. half a year, and so it's, it's, it's really close anyways, and maybe you don't need to be in the position before the elections. Uh, I would also uh, encourage uh, you to read the article, uh, Five High Stake Cases of Ukraine Outgoing, Prosecutor General Lutsenko on our webpage en.hromatsky.ua. So just remind that there are a couple of uh, really important cases on Yanukovych, on Nadia Savchenko, uh, on Amber Lawmakers, and as well the access to the journalist phones. That's something we, you need to know. Uh, but to finalize this discussion, so what we expect today? from the Ukrainian authorities. We already talked about general prosecutor, but as well minister of interior in case of the investigation of the death and mur of murder of Katerina Handzuk, who we probably need to remind was speaking about high level corruption and systematic corruption in the police office in her region, Kherson. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so now we are waiting for some results of the investigation and public reports about this. And uh, even not uh, just in the case of Hanzuk, because in the case of Hanzuk, we have five persons arrested, and uh, it's, it seems that uh, it's going to some, something. But uh, in other cases, there is no uh, any movement, and uh, it's really concerning uh, civil society because uh, uh, our state cannot protect uh, our people and people with active position. My, my final is like, can you clarify as a law? Lawyer, if there is a case of particular, sus, sus, you know, if she was speaking, Katya Handzuk, mm -hmm. about the national police in Kherson, and, you know, when she was still alive, she said, I knew who were those who ordered the, um, who, who kind mm -hmm. of, who were attacking me. Uh, how, what should we do really with the national police? Mm -hmm which yeah. is also part of the investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, Katerina Hansuk uh, fight with, uh, against, uh, fought with uh, against, local, uh, police, local yeah. Uh, yeah, authorities, local police. So uh, Kherson local police cannot investigate this case. And uh, as I know, now uh, prosecutor's office split two different criminal proceedings. Uh, one uh, investigates a general investigative unit uh, in Kyiv of state security service uh, and uh, uh, the second one uh, still uh, investigates uh, national police, uh, local police, yeah. And uh, general prosecutor, uh, he has this authority to unite them and uh, to take uh, just to state security service. So I think that uh, finally it will, uh, it will investigate, say, in level of Kyiv, in uh, all Ukrainian level, and not uh, on that local, local level, because, of course, uh, in case of uh, corruption, pressure, and so on, it will not be uh, some impartial and efficient investigation. Thank you. That was uh, Yevhen Krapivin, the lawyer and expert from reanimation package of reform. And I should say, as Ukrainian journalists, we are discussing that the part of our obligation is also to cover what's going on in Kherson region. Yes, it's a regional case, but probably it had be put into the light and also internationally. Thanks a lot for the for attention. That was uh, the Sunday show, the Romansk International. But I'll remind that uh, you can and you should follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Search Romansk International as well. Go to the web page en.romanske.ua where all the full version of our interviews and reports. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter and uh, receive weekly updates. Uh, that was all for this week and see you next week.